hello, my name is Anya and I am a numismatist. And I know that sounds a little bit like an Alcoholics Anonymous type of mission, um, but I am quite proud of that particular passion. So for the purposes of today's talk, I am an unashamed coin geek. My museum career has been quite varied, but my particular interest lies in historic coins, especially those of the early medieval period. Having that interest and working in museums has also led me to an interest in the phenomenon of marginalised collections. Those areas of museum holdings which, while not actually orphaned and forgotten, are becoming less visible in museum activities. These tend to be collections which would benefit from some specialist expertise, but where the realities of museum funding mean that they are often in the care of staff with a broad remit, a huge workload and little time to investigate their collections. This category may refer to many different artefact types, geological samples, for instance, or technical industrial machinery. And in my experience, numismatics are increasingly becoming a marginalised collection. In these times of fewer and fewer subject specialist curatorial roles, it's rare to find a keeper of numismatics outside the National Museums. I've been lucky enough to have the chance to do some research into this. My MA dissertation examined the situation for the numismatic collections in local authority museums in the East Midlands, and it reared its head again as part of my recent PhD research. My doctoral project was an investigation of the English coinages of William the Conqueror and William Rufus. I examined the coins to see what narratives they could reveal about life in early Norman England, and then went on to investigate how those stories could help us to engage the public with the period. Museums, of course, are one of the key media for dissemination of stories of the past. So my research included a study of how the UK heritage industry currently treats this area. I discovered that I'd managed to trip into something of a double whammy of marginalisation. In addition to the marginalisation of numismatics, it seems that there is also a bit of a dearth when it comes to Norman England. Representation of the Norman period of England history, English history is surprisingly rare in museum displays, and part of this may be to do with current trends in museology. This paper, therefore, examines the issues of marginalisation of both museum coins and of Norman England, and suggests a few of the pitfalls and potential solutions when considering new displays. So what's the problem with, Nor with the history of Norman England? As part of my research, I visited a variety of UK museums, including nationals, university museums and local sites. In many of these, the Norman period was almost invisible. Where local history is presented, it's common to mention the Norman conquest and maybe allude to the entry in Doomsday Book for the particular town, but then move straight on to the high medieval period. This photograph from the Museum of Liverpool off offers a nice visual analogy of this. It shows a chronological timeline exhibition which covers a number of display cases, and the period of Norman England falls exactly in the gap between these two cases. The case on the left ends with 1066, and the one on the right starts with 1207. Now this is of course a coincidence of the necessities of space and visitor walkways, but it always rather tickles me to see a physical gap where the Norman period should be. Even in the British Museum, the period is not given much display space. The BM doesn't have a chronological layout to its displays, instead having galleries focused on individual periods of history. However, the Norman period isn't really discussed in either the Anglo-Saxon or the medieval galleries. It falls into a thematic gap between the two. Detailed displays about Norman England tend to only be found at sites which are specifically related to the period. Norwich Castle Museum, which is housed in a Norman keep, tackles the period in some depth, and unfortunately I missed the talk yesterday, but I understand that the new display schemes were discussed then. Um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the new schemes. I believe they focus even more um, fo closely on the early history of the castle. Battle Abbey, which was founded by William the Conqueror on the site of the Battle of Hastings, also deals with the period, giving detailed information about the course of the battle and the subsequent foundation of the abbey before going on to talk about monastic life later in the medieval period. However, even in sites with a particular Norman history, the period is sometimes surprisingly difficult to find. Colchester Castle, which as we've just heard is housed in a Norman keep like Norwich Castle is, focuses somewhat understandably on the Roman history of the town, but it dedicates only a single display case to tell the story of the whole of the Saxon, Viking and Norman periods. Understandably, in such a small space, the period does not receive very detailed interpretation. 
Now, there are a number of possible reasons for this lack of visibility of the Norman period in displays. One of these may be to do with traditions in the history of museums. For many years, throughout the Enlightenment and Victorian pe um, periods, the history of early medieval England was rather denigrated. It was considered that the period represented something of a backward slide in the kingdom's progression from barbarism to civilization, which was going very well under the Romans, but then um, faltered in the so-called Dark Ages and was not corrected until the Renaissance and the subsequent Age of Empire. Even as late as the 1950s and 60s, it wasn't uncommon for urban archaeological investigations to dig straight through the modern and medieval layers with only a cursory glance as they headed for the Roman remains. This had two effects for early museums. Firstly, it meant that museum collections contained proportionally fewer items of medieval material culture than of the earlier and later periods. And secondly, it made interpretation of the period a much lower priority than others. As well as its relative scarcity, the nature of medieval material in museum collections is also problematic for the Norman period. Most museum displays tend towards the traditional narrative of the Norman Conquest, which presents the Battle of Hastings as a defining moment in English history, which instigated rapid and large-scale change across society, dispossessing the native peoples and ushering in a new Norman way of life. The image of William the Conqueror is often still rather like this, albeit maybe without the fine Victorian facial hair. However, this story is rooted in the written histories of the period and is not so easy to tell with physical objects. In many ways, the material culture of Norman England is not clearly distinct from that which came before or after it, and it is thus sometimes tricky to identify artefacts which specifically come from a Norman context. Naturally, if you're trying to tell a story of societal change and you don't have any artefacts with which to illustrate that change, it's difficult to present the story in any detail. In this context, a move towards thematic display could exacerbate the existing problem. If a history is displayed chronologically, there is a need to at least mention the coming of the Normans. However, if a collection is arranged by theme or treats different periods discreetly, like at the British Museum, there is less impetus to interpret the eras which are not easily represented by the collection. So the Norman period risks becoming even less visible in our museum displays. One of the few classes of objects which can be definitively dated to the Norman period is the coinage issued in the kingdom at that time. And possibly rather ironically, the coinage doesn't tell a story of societal change, but is instead incredibly consistent across the period of the conquest. Here are a few examples of coins of early medieval, um, early medieval England. So we've got one of Ethelred the Unready at the top, then Edward the Confessor on the right, and then Harold Godwinson, who was defeated by William at the Battle of Hastings at the bottom. You can see um, that um, all of these coins are of very similar styles. They're all silver pennies. They have the portrait of the king on the front with his name and titles in the inscription around the edge. And on the back, they have a religious or propaganda symbol and some administrative information in the form of the name of the town where the coin was minted and the name of the mint official, known as a moneyer, who was accountable for that particular coin. Now, this is one of William the Conqueror's English coins. In design, it's really similar to the early coins of the, uh, the coins of the earlier Anglo-Saxon kings. But what's really interesting is that it's also very different to the coins of Ducal Normandy, which William was issuing at the same time across the Channel. So this is one of William's Norman coins. Um, even taking into account the degree of wear and possible clipping on this coin, you can see that the design is much cruder, and actually the weight and silver content of these coins is also much lower than the contemporary English coinage. So to go back to the English coin, as well as looking like the Anglo-Saxon coins, the inscriptions are also very similar. I know they're very difficult to read, so I've highlighted them here using my fantastic Microsoft Paint skills. I'm going to really miss Microsoft Paint when it's no longer available. Um, but, um, so each of the inscriptions has a little cross, which I've highlighted in yellow, which marks where the inscription starts. So that's where the beginning of the inscription is. The inscription on the front reads, reads W-I-L-L-E-M-V-R-E-X. The W is um, actually a runic W, which looks like a P. So it's short for Wilhelmus Rex, which obviously means King William. And on the back, after the initial cross, we have L-E-I-G-S-I-N-G-O-N-E-O, -E -E which is short for Leg Sing on Eofuich. Um, on means at, so this inscription means money a lacing at the mint of York, Yofowich. So these moneyers are another pe um, piece of evidence of continuity. 
The men named on the coins of William I and II are almost all the same men or, of the same um, or the, um, with similar Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Scandinavian names to the people who were striking the coins for Edward the Confessor and Harold Godwinson before the conquest. So you get the, um, the names of individual moneyers showing continuity across the conquest. Moneyers who were striking coins for Edward and Harold are still striking coins for William I. And then their successors over the next 35 years are still of likely Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Scandinavian origin. You don't start getting French names appearing on the coins until the reign of Henry I, some 35 years after the Norman Conquest. And even then, they are very few in number and maybe more of a relation to a fashion for um, French names within the English nobility at that point, um, rather than necessarily being Normans who have come in and taken on these positions. My recent research also highlighted a number of other ways in which the coinage of William I and II shows continuity from the earlier English coinages. There is change, but the picture which appears is one of a gradual shift in the English monetary system, which takes place over many decades, starting well before the conquest and continuing into the later medieval period. The changes cannot be tied to one specific date, such as 1066, or even to the reign of any one specific king. So maybe we need to be rethinking our narratives of early medieval England and representing the Norman period in a different way. So the coins can clearly be helpful in presenting these new stories, but as I mentioned, coin collections are unfortunately becoming less visible in display across the heritage sector. In the past, many museums had numismatic galleries, but the objects in them were often displayed in serried ranks, arranged taxonomically by their classification, with little social or historical interpretation. And even I, as the unashamed coin geek, will admit that displays like this are very, very dull. <laughs> Understandably, as museums move to more engaging, narrative and relatable display schemes, these traditional coin displays started to disappear, which wasn't a bad thing. However, curators were then left with the problem of how to use coins in these broader displays in ways that made them accessible and interesting. Coins have something of a bad reputation in museum circles. There is a perception that they are a difficult artefact to use. They are small and intricate, as well as double-sided, and they're that they require a lot of explanation in order to interpret them. However, this shouldn't be the case. Coins are easily comprehensible to modern audiences, as everyone still knows essentially what they are. They don't need explanation of their basic function in the way that, say, a spindle world does. They're also beautiful and have that bling factor that Glyn was just talking about, which can attract the eye of a viewer even before their fascinating stories are revealed. With good mounting and lighting, coins can be very effectively displayed. The main issue seems to be in accessing the stories which are held within the coins. To a non-specialist, such as a generalist curator trying to look after the whole gamut of museum collections, coins seem to only easily tell a fairly limited story about the mode of exchange in the past with a sideline on the authority and image of the person in power. Where a museum is using thematic interpretation schemes, this can lead to numismatics being overlooked. Unless your theme is financial, it can be difficult to see at first glance how coins could fit. Some museums do indeed use coins very effectively for interpreting financial themes. The British Museum and the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, for example, still have coin galleries, but their interpretation now explores notions of money and value and how this affects various aspects of society. In other museums, coins appear within displays of other objects, and they are often interpreted very simply, just as examples of what the money of a particular period was like, rather than as evidence of a personal, social or historical narrative. This is a shame, as with more detailed investigation, it becomes clear that coins can contribute to exploration of a wide variety of themes and issues. Having had the luxury of spending a few years dedicated to investigating the stories held in the coins of William I and II, I can cite many examples of how they could be used to help elucidate themes. The coins touch on ideas as broad as social class, creation of identity and family relationships, as well as more obvious notions of politics and economics. For the purposes of today, though, I will just talk about a couple of examples. One of the areas which always fascinates people when talking about coinage is the idea of forgery and cheating the system. The surviving early medieval law codes include harsh punishments for anyone found guilty of producing bad coinage. A code of Canute from around 1020 stipulates that money as found guilty would have their hand amputated. And by the end of the century, this punishment had been increased to include castration as well as the loss of the hand. 
However, the coinage of William I and II shows that despite these brutal deterrents, money has still allowed bad coinage to be made. The penny on this slide is an example of a very lightweight coin. It's just three quarters of the weight that it should have been. If a money was habitually producing coins of light weight, he would obviously have used less of his silver and therefore been able to make more of a profit for himself. Similarly, some coins have clearly been struck with coining dies which have been altered to change the name of the money or mint in the reverse inscription. This coin seems to have originally said Elfsey. So I've tried to highlight it there. So you've got the A and the E conjoined, and then an L and an F and an S. The I has been missed off because the names were often um, abbreviated on the coins. However, it has been altered, so it now looks more like IDCN, which obviously isn't really a name, but it certainly is trying to obscure the original name on the coin. This sort of alteration would have the effect of obscuring the name of the person, um, which would thus make it difficult to hold that money to account if the coin was found to be underweight or of poor quality silver. Now, these sorts of bad coins do not make up a large percentage of the pennies which have survived to the present day, but they are sufficiently numerous to make it clear that the monetary system was still being cheated throughout the reigns of the early Norman kings. The moneyers who indulged in these practices must have thought it was worth it, Presumably, they would have weighed up the extra profit they could make against the likelihood of being caught and mutilated and decided that it was worth the risk. Unfortunately, we don't have many surviving records of the enactment of the laws from this period, so we can't tell how many people were ever convicted and punished for passing bad coinage. But in the reign of Henry I, just after the period I've been investigating, the histories record an incident which has been dubbed the Assize of the Moneyers. At Christmas 1124, the king called all the moneyers of the kingdom to Winchester, and when, once they were there, those who were considered to have been passing bad coin were all mutilated and stripped of their position in one mass um, event. This incident shows that punishments for this offence were certainly carried out sometimes, even if we can't tell just how frequently it happened. The coins therefore allow us to explore themes of crime and punishment, authority and power, the level and efficacy of control wielded by the government, and the agency of individual people within the kingdom in the form of the moneyers. To take a rather more prosaic theme, the coinage of William I and II can also offer insights into the notion of travel in the English kingdom in the late 11th century. Since the coins name the mint town where they were made, by tracing their find spots, we can get an idea of how the money was circulating in the kingdom. But even more specifically, there are examples of equipment and personnel moving from one place to another. The coins on this slide are die-linked coins, which means that both coins were made using one of the same coining dies. So in this period, coins were made by putting a blank disc of metal between a pair of dies which had been engraved with the designs for the front and back of the coin. The top die was then struck with a hammer and the designs were thus embedded into the disc of metal. All the coining dies were engraved by hand, and the, um, which means that each one was slightly different. This, of course, translates to the coins. So coins struck with the same dies will have identical designs on each side, um, while coins struck with different dies will be slightly different. Now, ignoring the positioning and the patterns of wear, the fronts of these two coins are exactly the same. Um, I've measured various points and how they, how they match up. Um, so this shows that these two coins were struck using the same obverse die, the same die for the front of the coin. The backs, however, are different, and they tell an interesting story. The coin at the top was struck by Mania Sibode at London, but the coin at the bottom was struck by Mania Elfwine at Exeter. At some point, therefore, either Sibode and Elfwine were in the same place and the die changed hands between them, or the die was sent from one town to the other. In either case, though, someone must have travelled between London and Exeter in order to facilitate the sharing of this coining die. The coinage also provides further evidence of the movement of people. The coin at the top was minted in York by money at Ulfcatel in the period around 1068 to 1070. The other coin was minted by Ulf Cattell, but this one was minted at Cambridge in the late 1070s. We can't be certain that the two Ulf Cattells were the same man, of course, but it is a very uncommon name in 11th century England. So it's quite likely that they were either the same person or at least related to each other, as um, there was an Anglo-Saxon tendency for sharing of um, elements of names across the generations. And there's a very good reason why Ulf Cattell may have moved from York to Cambridge. The top coin was minted just, um, just before the earls of the northern part of the kingdom rose in rebellion against Norman rule. 
prompting a year of fighting which ended with the king's vicious retribution known as the harrying of the north. As a moneyer, Ulf Cattell was a man of high standing in the community, holding a position within the king's administration. It's quite easy to understand why someone in this position might choose to flee from the area in a time of unrest and move somewhere more stable, far from the fighting. There are a number of other examples in the coins which show money as moving from one town to another during the reigns of the first two Norman kings. On top of this, we know from Doomsday that in this period, all the coining dies were made in a single place in London and moneyers, or their trusted representatives, would have to collect their new dies from there and pay a fee, of course, each time the design of the coins was changed. The coins therefore provide ample evidence that in the late 11th century, travel around England was not just possible, it was an expected part of the moneyer's role and probably happened with a frequency that we might now find surprising. And to prove that it's not all just theoretical, I wanted to show you a really good example of a display which uses not just coins, but Norman coins. This is from Hastings Museum and Art Gallery, and is the first case in their gallery, A History of Hastings in 66 Objects. <coughs> to my delight, the first of their 66 objects is a coin of my period. This is great when I found this. The interpretation talks about the coming of the Normans in 1066, but also examines how that would have affected the moneyers by discussing how they would have had to change their coining dies and mint coins for three different kings during that one year. Further, the speech bubble includes a snippet of extra information, noting that the moneyer of this particular coin had a long working life in the Hastings Mint, and suggesting that his name, Dunnink, may have survived to the present day in the common local surname Dunk. This single coin has therefore been used to discuss working practice, administration and local genealogy, as well as relating big historic events to the lives of individual people. So these examples show that coinage can be a good source of narratives and evidence relating to a variety of themes which we might want to discuss in our museum displays. The problem still remains, however, of how to find out about those narratives in order to display them. As museum professionals with very little spare time, it's not feasible to undertake detailed study of the collections, unfortunately, or to read academic journals in order to keep up to date with the latest findings of other people's research. With so few subject specialists in roles within museums, it is understandable that coins and other marginalised collections are often not even considered when thematic displays are being planned. This is a tricky problem to solve. Ideally, we would want a sudden influx of funding to allow us to reintroduce specialist roles in all museum services, or at least in all regions. But in the absence of that proverbial magic money tree, I think we can go some way to alleviating the problem by nurturing our industry networks. Subject specialist groups such as the Money and Medals Network and of course the Fantastic Society for Museum Archaeology are vital for disseminating information and being a point of contact for people searching for skills and expertise to help with their collections. Informal contacts are also important, of course, and I'm very happy to help out with any coin queries that anyone would like to send me. Um, but we can also look beyond the sector and make connections with our local community groups. Most areas have an amateur numismatic society and they are often only too happy to undertake identification, research and advice on museum collections. Finding your local numismatic society can be helped by looking at the website of the um, uh, BANS, the British Association of Numismatic Societies, which lists all the, all the um, societies in the country with their contact details. Possibly the most important thing, however, is to make sure that when we are planning a new display, whether it's using an innovative interpretation strategy or a more traditional technique, we give ourselves the time and space to think about the whole broad scope of our collections and the possibility of using those objects which might have been sitting in storage for years, waiting to come off the margins. So here are my contact details. Thank you very much for listening. And are there any questions?